Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker and I grew up watching As the World Turns and Guiding Light. I joined the PR department at both shows and remained working there for 13 years before the shows went off the air. As I was stuck here in quarantine, I was thinking about the shows I grew up watching and how I was missing them and thought some of you at home might be feeling the same way as I was. Well, today I have some of your favorites. I know you've all been asking me to bring some more Pine Valley folks to the locker room, and today we've got a great group of actors. Vincent Irizarry, who played Dr. David Hayward, Aidan Turner, who played Aidan Devane, Walt Willie, who played Jackson Montgomery, and Jacob Young, who played J.R. Chandler. Let's bring them all on and say hello. Hey, Vincent, Walt, Jacob. Alan, how are you? How are you, man? Thanks so much Thank for you, joining everybody. me today. Yeah, thanks for having us. How's everybody holding up? Hey, everyone. Pleasure. I'm happy to be here. How's everyone holding good, up? Good. I'm not seeing good. everybody on my hand. How are you? I'm doing, doing great. Doing I feel right. good. I'm holding up, you know, doing the best I can right now. I'm not seeing anybody Any else, Alan. Just okay, so we're sorry. all here. So uh, can you hear them? Uh, your glasses might might make the difference there, Vince. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, make sure you access your camera. Can, can they you, hear can each you other? We, yeah. We, can you hear us all, Vincent? What's the matter? Can you hear us all? I just heard Jacob just now, and he just popped. I can hear you, Alan. I can hear Jacob. I ha I can't even see um, Walt or Aiden yet. Yeah, it could be. Uh, and I have my else. glasses on, so I should be able to see them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know. It, it, it's definitely the internet on on your end. If you you know if you want to try to you know just kick it yeah, kick it off no, and come back in, correct. it's up to you. But anyway, um, has anyone taken up anything no, new? Right. Being, I mean, hold on. Has anyone taken up anything being stuck in quarantine? Any any new uh, projects or learning anything? Well, I actually started this before the uh, lockdown, but I was glad I did. I, uh, you know, I was, I always thought that I was going to be a graphic artist. The acting thing came a little later to me and I went back and started to uh, try to learn how to do watercolor painting. So I've been doing quite a bit of that. Teaching I yourself? Teaching. Uh, well, I went to a class, which was a lot of women my age who like to talk most of the time so there wasn't much class to it but no i've taken some online classes just go out and find the the stuff and look into it and uh it's been fun so I'm, i've been doing that i guess for about a year or so that's great well Walt, i Anybody remember else? i remember that you were very much into sketching and writing and drawing and at that time I yeah and I, and I thought that would help me with watercolor but as it turns out not not very much <laughs> really kind of a, that's kind of interesting a, yeah, i went when i first started i was kind of drawing with paint which is not the way to do it at all. And uh, so, you know, across time here, I've, I've gotten maybe a little a little better at it. I figure if I have another 20 years, I'll be a really great watercolor artist. Well, that's cool. That's I'm hoping cool. for another 20 years. We'll see. <laughs> yes. Any, Working towards it. Anybody else take anything up? I mean, uh, I've no, no, no. recently how to raise my children. <laughs> <laughs> you have three young ones at home, right? I think. <laughs> Are you homeschooling? Yeah, so uh, actually Utah is a little bit ahead as far as like um, school, uh, you know, out for summer. So today was the final day for the kids here in Utah. They always start wow. school a little bit earlier than most uh, school semesters or years uh, compared to other states. But um, today was the last day, so the kids found out what their new teachers were. But in the meantime, mom and dad have been uh, educating at home, and that has been kind of interesting because my son will come down and be like, "Ah, oh, good morning, dad. I just uh, just finished my schoolwork." And I'm like, "It's seven o'clock in the morning. I know you just woke up 15 minutes ago." Um, so, so we've had to regulate that a little bit. Aiden, you too have a young one at home, right? Yeah, he finished. Uh, he finished school uh, yesterday. So, um, yeah, social distancing. We had to, to drive there uh, to the school, and he picked up his uh, certificate. He's only um, no, no. be five October first, so they gave him a little certificate for preschool, and um, and uh, uh, they gave us a loaf of bread 
um, which is great because yeah, in this time I suppose it's uh, we, we need to to make uh, grilled cheese sandwiches and uh, tomato soup or, or something. But it was great. Um, we've been homeschooling uh, every day from uh, from ten to uh, eleven thirty. Normally he goes for five hours every day, every morning. So it's an hour and a half uh, in the morning. So uh, the rest of the time, uh, he's been sort of um, causing havoc around the house and uh, outside, outside the house. So I've just been trying to keep him busy and uh, keep him out of trouble. And um, well, you know, my fiance Jessica works, but he's um, yeah, he's been loving it. You know, he's been loving being at home and and the camaraderie and, and how much fun he has with, with his um, with his nanny, his mum and dad, and um, you know, it's quarantine is, uh, has been you know a bit tough to all be stuck in the house uh, for the last eight weeks. But been doing lots of gardening, lots of painting. I wouldn't say renovating, but painting the you know the outside and just uh, inside and fixing up things that normally you wouldn't have time to do. So it hasn't been too bad. Just to, yeah, know, it's just to keep the wife off my back. That's yeah, I was going to say. It's kind of tough to duck those things when you're home all day. <laughs> <laughs> you don't true, have an yeah. excuse. Yeah. yeah. There isn't. <laughs> well, that's why. I, that's, that's why it seems like happy hours starting earlier every day. Happy hours start earlier every day. Well, mine mine started March 10th, so I guess that's a little. <laughs> you know, honestly, for me, I've been. I've, yeah. Yeah, that's true, March. You started before yeah. the Ides of March. Okay. Absolutely. Why, why um, get I, I, I've rush. actually been doing my real estate, so that's been keeping me very busy. Yeah, really, no kidding. Um, I, it's actually been very kind of, it's been a very busy few weeks for me. My um, my my oldest son just had my second granddaughter. Oh, my God. Oh, congratulations. Um, and, congratulations. Yeah, so, yeah, I became a grandfather last year. And now they just had another girl, um, two granddaughters I have now. And my son, Elias, he just graduated the other day from high school. So he's having his high school graduation in South Carolina. I'm going to be going there in about a week and a half to go be there. It's, it's, it, it's kind of a limited graduation ceremony where it's only the students are going to be there on a football field. And they're going to do it in closed circuit. Um, but they are going to do pictures with families that are scheduled throughout the, uh, the first few days before that. Nice. So I'm going to be doing that too. And Aiden, I'm going to be in Atlanta. You're in Atlanta, right? Yep, in Atlanta, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be in Atlanta next week. I'm going to go see see my sister uh, for a few days. So Yeah, we're about to see you. You have to let me know. To, we she lives connect. in Woodstock. She lives in the Woodstock area. Okay, yeah, it's not too far. Okay. It's too All far right, from well, me. Well, maybe I'll see 30 you. minutes north. Yeah, All you can right. just man. come see me on the way or on the way back or whenever. Yeah, it would be good to uh, sure, catch man. up with you. That would be good. It would be good to see you, man. Cool. I, I'm, yeah, I'm sure good. everybody's li liquor bills are up since uh, March 10th. Yes. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, you obviously don't know good... much about Utah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Sorry. You're... <laughs> Very good. Good, good point. Good and point. I gotta tell you, I got some stories. <laughs> yes, yeah, my, uh, sure. my auntie, uh, my mum's sister lives, uh, younger sister lives in South Africa, and she has done for the last twenty-five years. And so, for some reason, the government over there they stopped all cigarette sales and all liquor sales, so she can't get even a glass of wine. She doesn't smoke anymore, and nor does her, uh, her husband. But there's, you know, there's no one anymore. No, they they uh, stopped it because of, anything. because of this. Yeah, just uh, yeah on the lockdown. Uh, well, well, I, I, the think, I think in uh, there, uh, what I had read was there was some some violent acts that had happened, and and I think that was what encouraged that lockdown. Unfortunately, such a lovely country. I was so lucky to go there two years ago, and and visit. And um, I don't remember much of it because I was drunk the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, well, let's go and talk about Pine Valley. Do you all remember your first day in Pine Valley? Actually, yeah, well, I do remember my first day. It was with uh, Dr. David Haywood and Anna Devane, and uh, just being <laughs> there right. on, the, on the set. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was amazing. Are you? Did you remember that, Vince? <laughs> 
you know, you know, yes, I do. I do remember. So I was like, moving. okay, so, so, so Aiden is playing like, Aiden, is basically, I remember. Aiden? Yeah. Yeah. Aiden no, it was so correct. I thought you were even, are you really You're the off. nephew of Anna Devane? Yeah. And uh, yeah, they, 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 you and and yeah. Finoli Hughes <laughs> looked after me so well, and um, you know I was like a deer in the headlights, and you know saying my lines and trying to do the best job I could. I, I kind of remember that too, Aidan. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> you do? Yeah, I, I do kind of remember that too. I can tell you were a little nervous, so we do what we could to make you relax. Yeah, that's right. Fun. Yeah, I was. Uh, you're right. You're a sweetheart from the moment you came on. <laughs> Is that when Fanola pu Fanola pulled a gun yeah. on you? Most people are. I mean, that's reasonable. Is that yeah. when Fanola pulled a gun on you? Yeah, I'm not sure. I just, well, the, the who me? No, no, Fanola. I, I think he was stalking. Yeah, I think uh, I think so. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah, I I, good I just wa I just watched it before this. <laughs> I just oh, I think there was some fake oh, that's fine. I, I was like, you know, taking honest, in man. the whole thing and the camera guys and the, oh, yeah. and all the, uh, the the crew and then looking at the actors and then you know I was so distracted by everything that was going on. It was, yeah, it was my first day and um, it, uh, I just remember Vince and Fanola just being sweethearts and yeah, you know, just like ah, oh, you got it, you got it. Got it. But I was just taking all everything in, you know, and um, it was it was yeah. a great first day, and and I you know I remember going home that that night. Yeah. I was only what twenty three years old, so that's twenty years ago. Um, I just thought, wow, okay, this is gonna be good. I think I think I can do this. Just learn my lines I, I first. Say, the next I five hours. Say, well, you got me on a good day. You got me on a good day. <laughs> oh, I love you, dude. You're great. I have to say, Aiden, some of my best and most favorite scenes. Wow. And we had some very good stuff that we'd worked on together and very remember, memorable. And I'm, I'm, you know, you, you know, from coming from this handsome, you know, beautiful model coming out of, uh, out of the UK into the United States and blossoming into this fine actor. And I have to say that um, you really, uh, you know, you really challenged me in many, many scenes. So I'm very thankful to, right. for those. <clears throat> Well, thank oh, you. I, thank you very much. Ben. I mean, you, you guys were so great and been doing it. And so you taught me everything that, that you knew. And uh, yeah, it's either sink or swim on a soap, you know, it's like doing a movie every day. So you guys have been used to it. You're, you're amazing. So thank you for that. And Walt, you said you remember yours? Yeah, I, I, I as I recall, uh, my first scenes weren't with, with uh, Lucci. They were, in fact, with David Canary. And wow. I, had, I had worked on Another World at some point before that. I had a little mini contract there. And, you know, David had, had been there for some time. And he was, you know, he's so still respected on that show, even though he wasn't there any longer. And so here I am working with him. I ring the doorbell of whatever place he was. I'm not quite sure what place he was. And he opens the door, and all I could hear was the Bonanza theme. Just dun 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 dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I couldn't remember a line to save my life. I mean, it was just, yeah. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'd, I'd been around that set on and off quite a bit because I'd done a lot of extra work and under five and day player stuff. And I'd done Ryan's Hope just before that. And but I just I it was like it was like first day in any studio ever when you know working with and David was so sweet. And so nice. And the scene, I guess, went fine. But it was, you know, when, when you get that buzz in your ear, the, zzzz, the whole scene's played through that because you're just fearful and stuff. So I don't remember what was said exactly, but I do remember him answering the door. And it was like, oh, my God, it's David. It's it's Candy, for God's sake. I'm working with Candy. So, yeah. yeah. Jacob, do you remember yours? I do. I do very, very well. Um, you know, I had an interesting situation. Um, uh, I was I had just left General Hospital on, on my own terms and was was, you know, was trying to gear up to do some other projects and whatnot and was able to do a couple things in between. And Julie Carruthers, who then came on as producer, she had asked me if I was interested in maybe coming on all my children because she was getting ready to produce. And it was an interesting scenario because she said, do you want to play Tad Martin's son or do you want to play Adam, you know, Adam Chandler's son? And yeah. my mother and father watched my mother, my, my stepfather rather, 
watch the show and I, as long as I can remember. I mean, like I I knew Walt before I knew Walt, you know, and I knew, you know, <laughs> I was already I was already well like engrossed in the series as a young child. So it was it was very exciting. And I was like, you know, I, I was like, who do I choose? Who do I do? <laughs> but, um, but of course, David Canary, you know, I mean, I just admired his his ability to to transform from Adam to Stuart on a dime. And like, yeah. I, that's all I could remember as a child is, is, you know, this guy like, you know, like transitioning. And I always thought as a kid that it was two separate people playing that role. Um, you know, obviously as I got older, I realized that it wasn't the case, but, but I said, Adam, I want to play Adam Chandler's son. At, and so at what uh, age were you when you realized that, that wasn't two people. I'm just, I'm curious. Shit, I probably, I probably was, it was probably 18, 18 years old. I was like, wow, those guys are good. Very good, very good. So, so the first, the first day was, um, uh, they brought on Alexa Havens and she had, uh, they had, they had had me come out to New York to screen test like five girls um, and I knew right away that she she had something that was different from the most. And they they asked me, they said, hey, Jacob, do you, you know, do you, you know, what is your opinion? I'm like, it's like I said, like, my opinion really matters. And they said, no, no, actually, your, your opinion does because you're going to be working with her. And I said, oh, OK, well, in that case, uh, I think that she has this, you know, this amazing like ability. She just like she dropped tears like in the audition scene you know it was it was so organic and it was real so she ended up uh she ended up being cast. and the first episode coming on of course was with david and, and my character had been on a tramp steamer and it was it was kind of funny because you know you know i'm i'm trying to like i don't know i don't know much about the jr character because i was obviously i was working on another show at the time but I sort of decided to integrate what I thought and what they were giving me. And it was, it was a funny scene because I'm introducing my new wife who had married overseas to my dad, who happens to you know, be this multimillionaire. And it was a funny time. I said, and he goes, babe, babe, what? And she goes, no, it's just babe. And he was like, what do you mean? Like share? Madonna? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the David Canary way, and it was hysterical. And in that same day, I worked with Stewart, so I keep them both separate. It was, and I remember when I worked with David as Stewart, I couldn't even hold it together because I, I was just so excited. It was so genuine, it was so honest, and it was so compelling that I couldn't help but almost like I was chuckling inside because it made my heart swell in such a wonderful way. Um, and, um, you know, he was, he was just, he was amazing. Every day I worked with that man, I knew it was going to be a good day because my scenes were going to be that much better. I mean, what was it like for your mother and your stepdad to see you play his son? <laughs> uh, mom, mom is a faithful watcher. She tuned in every single day. She would give her critiques. Because I was always like, so, so what did you think? Was it okay? Was it, was it political that day? Um, but but she, she loved it, and uh, she's been a fan for years. So, it, you know, it, you know, you know, it's, it's true what they say. It definitely passes down through, you know, decade to decade, generation to generation. Um, grandmothers educated their, their, their daughter, you know, their, their, you know, their granddaughters, and so on and so forth, mothers, daughters. And you know we have a, such a unique, uh, a unique sons, sons, <laughs> sons daughters, yeah, all yeah, of you. yeah, yeah. yeah. Vincent, yeah, do you very, remember your first day? Sorry, sorry, Vincent. Uh, yeah, Vincent. I do. I remember when I was on. Um, I. Yeah, can you hear me? You good? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me, Alan? Yeah. yeah okay. Yes, um, my first day I, I came on, I worked with uh, Joe Martin and with um, Ala Karat, um, and I was doing characters, um, scenes with Jake um, at the time, which is Michael Lowry, who was playing Jake at that time. 
<clears throat> and I soon after, that was the, my second day, I think it was, I worked with David Canary, so similar to, to Jacob. And that was like a huge thrill for me to work with him. And it was one of those days where it was like five hours of doing several shows in the same set with David playing both characters, um, Adam and Stuart. And I swear to God, after that, that five hours watching them play both roles, doing the scenes twice over, but from different, from, from both characters, I felt like I had just witnessed a master class, frankly, um, with him. Mm -hmm. He was freaking brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I, I, one of the most gracious people I've ever worked with. Um, you know, and I've always felt that way about it. working on any show that there's a trickle down effect. When the people that are kind of the stars of the show, are gracious and professional and, and you know kind to the people they were appreciative of everybody that they're working with it trickles down to everybody on the sound stage everybody on the set and that's the kind of that was the kind of an environment that i felt that we had there and all my children people were very loving for the most part and very respectful i mean there are always going to be moments with people but that and i do i attribute that to people like david canary people like susan lucci to um, Eileen Hurley and you know all of them, any of them, James Mitchell, um, Ruth Warwick, those people because of the way they were, that everybody else we just loved the the the, the environment of the set, the ambiance of the set. It was great, and the crew was wonderful because of that too. So. Yeah, when you're when you're first starting out and you see the David Canaries and the Ruth Warwicks and the Eileen Hurleys and the Susan Luchis, when you see them as you say vincent so gracious yeah. and kind and patient and you know you <laughs> it kind of makes you check yourself and go well i guess i have to act that way too even Absolutely. if you may not feel that way some days you uh have to be sure that they didn't either you know so but uh, yeah we well you know we we had i gotta say and i i hear this or heard this over and over and still hear how all my children maybe the best set in daytime because of that i think it was a trickle down effect mm -hmm. You know, it really was it's a great lesson to, to, to add to that for just one second. Um, you know, I've, you know, I've worked on several different sets, of uh, daytime dramas and with wonderful people and wonderful crew and wonderful, pro, you know, producers, but there's never been quite the feeling that I had with all my children. And I will, I will take that with me for the rest of my life. The friends that I met, just how we were able to, um, actually interact and do things outside of set and hang out with each other and just be, that was, that was to me the best time of my life at, at to this point, the best period of my life were those, those years on all my children. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah it, was Walt, like a, it was a family. I think we all hang Walt, out together. Post, all four of us. Yeah. Absolutely. Walt posted sure. a great, sorry. Walt po posted a great video of Susan at the last luncheon, I, I guess, just when the show. Oh, yeah. Had, yeah. Um, and I had interviewed Susan about two or three weeks ago, and I wish I had seen that before because I was just, I mean, that that's exactly what you're talking about. I mean, the, the class she mm -hmm. exuded, just sharing her heartfelt feelings about what the show meant, the writers, that everybody was firing on all yeah. cylinders at the end of the show. And just yeah. conveying that to, to everybody in the room, I thought was just, you know, class act. You know, um, and, and I think you take it out of the studio even, and you say it really trickled down from Agnes Nixon, who yes, wrote exactly. who had terrific uh, respect for actors and who wrote real characters you could get your teeth into. And I think, you know, that, that it really started there uh, with Joan D'Ancheco, right. you know, the, who was, who was head of casting when I first came. And I think, you know, when it starts there, they have a respect for actors, they have respect for the written word, they have respect for the process. I just think it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it was a lovely, lovely time. Speaking yeah. of Agnes, uh, I had seen a question from a fan earlier. Do you all know where your characters' names came from? Like, well, I came from somebody's trip to Alabama, I would guess, uh, or to Mississippi or someplace, <laughs> Jackson, Montgomery, uh, clearly a boy from the South. <laughs> I'm just no, curious if it's named after. Know. Yeah, I don't I just know Lorraine Broder created my character. And yeah, I was Lorraine very proud of created yeah, mine. And, I, and all I can tell you is where place. it was. She said it was in the bathroom. She thought yes, Kravitz exactly. needed a brother. I didn't ask her what she was doing in the bathroom. I was afraid she'd tell me. But that's all I know. The name, I don't know. 
Vincent, was yeah. Megan working on Guiding Light when you were there? Was Megan a writer at Guiding Light during? She came on for a period of time. Yes, she did come on there. But I, I mean, it was interesting working with Megan as a writer because I don't know if you remember this, um, Alan, that she was on Guiding Light with me. Oh yeah, totally. She was, yeah. She was Lola. She, I think, it was yeah. Lola was the name of the character. Um, she I worked as an right. actress on the show when I first started out as Lou Jack. And then she sort of segued into being part of writing staffs and then became head writers. Um, so yeah, so I did work with her on there as well. Um, I'm gonna have yeah. to I'm gonna have to look up YouTube clips of her because I totally remember her, but I, well, I can't well, place. Yeah. While you're doing that, look at Vince and myself working together on Guiding Lights, circa what 1912 or so. Yes, was, <laughs> 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 you you <laughs> did. Yes, it was, right, it, was right, it was right before the Spanish yeah. pandemic. The Spanish flu. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Before the Spanish flu. We got in the yeah. camp. Is, is, is getting ready to direct that. <laughs> yes, that's right. 1912. That's right. Well, did, that's you right. Work, did you work with Lou Jack, with Vincent? I Lou did. Yeah. Yeah, I, I played his probation officer, was it? Yes, you played by probation officer. That's right. Officer. We, I actually showed you that scene. I, I found right. it somewhere. Yeah. Well, that's not all you showed up. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, we watched it on, on your top-loading VHS, I think, didn't we? That's right. I it. It may, have, may have been beta. I don't know. Um, wow. I know. That's funny. That's true. Oh, that was like 1984 or something like it that? Was. It was. It was probably it was 1984 is when it was. Yeah, it was my yeah. first year as Lou Jack. When it was, I started in 83, wow. but it was, it was at the end of 83. So, yeah. 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 Wow. Crazy. So who or what was the biggest influence on all of you becoming an actor? Aiden? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, well, as you didn't ask me that um, before this interview, uh, and let me just think <laughs> off the top of my head. Become, becoming, <laughs> I love you. you know what? When I was young, um, uh, when I was young and living in England, I really loved Back to the Future. It was one of my favorite movies forever. So Michael J. Fox, you know, when when he was in uh, the Back to the Future one, two, three, I loved the the. Do an impression. Uh, I love um, the impression. I can't do him, but I can do Doc. Like, uh, Marty, it's a flux capacitor that makes time travel possible. Very good. <laughs> I don't know. I just love, I love the um, yeah, and I love the Bond movies. You know, uh, Sean Connery and uh, the uh, other actors that played Bond. But the when, when I was living in England, and uh, it rains most of the time. I mean. The last couple of years have been nice or whatever, but so my family says. But I, I loved um, what moved me to America was Baywatch, Beverly Hills, nine hundred two one zero, and uh, Melrose Place. But what really wanted me, made me want to be an actor, was like play, playing around and uh, yeah, like Michael J. Fox did on on the Back to the Future. It was just like wow, you can get paid for for doing that. That's amazing. And then, you know, the tinsel town and the, the glamour of Hollywood. And then so when I moved, well, I started acting in England. But then once um, uh, I went to New York for six months just to, you know, to give it a go, to see if I could get an agent. And then my first audition was all my children. And then uh, wow, you know, pretty much well, I, didn't, I didn't get the job then. But within two months later, I was testing on the set with, like Jacob said, with a couple of different actresses and uh, and then we just started work. And that's when I met Vincent and Finola Hughes. And it was just, it was just, you know, one and of the regretted getting the great eight years. <laughs> no, you no, uh, great eight years. Aiden, you need no, to, I, think I don't know if people you've... underestimate how hard it is to work on a soap. You do a movie every day. And now, yeah. now, you know, if you do, if you do movies, it's it, it goes so slowly, and they do four or five pages a day instead yeah. of ninety-five pages a day. It's it's like, come on, we can we can do this more quickly. In its last season, right? What's that? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, if loving you is wrong, it's in its last season. Now, yeah. I'm working on if loving you is wrong. On uh, Oprah Winfrey Network, yeah. The yeah, last season, it shoots, the uh, last it shoots season, pretty quickly too. The from going from a is, soap to something that is 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 uh, not a Monday through Friday sort of scenario, um, it's it you know the pressure is uh, it, you know if you've had the those early building blocks, how does it feel to yeah. be able to have, you know, to be able to do the kind of creative work that you could do on something like that? Well, you get you get so much more time, um, 
it's not about searching for 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 your lines um you get so much more time to work on your accent or your character um you know really to delve into you know the mind of the person that you're playing rather than making sure that you know you get the lines out you know so that they can move on with their day you know so you get the, the quality and you know but then you also as an actor you have to be patient and be willing to perform you know the scene when when you get around to doing it and uh and it goes over so many days one day can last four weeks so there's the other side is that you know that you that you have to stay in one day for a, for a long time but shooting with tyler perry he's he's been he's a you know he writes and directs and says so there's a lot more freedom to you know to play around but he also shoots very very quickly and um not not like a soap but similar to a soap you know three cameras at the same time and and uh, edits quickly so we, and the we last do, season is airing now yeah airing now yeah we've got five more episodes yeah. left every tuesday night at 10 p.m great and vincent on the own your network. Biggest, yeah on the own network yeah. your biggest influence to becoming an actor With, um wow I, well it actually i was going to music college Berkeley college of music um and there was an english teacher there rylan brenner who i became very close friends with he had a theater company and he invited me to audition for a play or a lead in a play and where acting was concerned i always felt it was something i had a, a, a genuine curiosity about um i always i grew up loving loving movies um and my brother and i would we sneak downstairs after my parents went to bed and we would sit in front of the tv right close to the tv so the volume wasn't too high and they didn't know we were watching the late show and the late late show till four o'clock in the morning <laughs> watching jimmy cadney movies and, you know, people like that. Um, but we would do that all the time. So when he invited me to participate in that, I won the part and I fell in love with the process. I just, it was sort of an epiphany for me because at the time I was, I was practicing piano six hours a day in a small piano room at college and I was becoming very antisocial. I, I became very withdrawn. Cool and this was a very explosive character and it just opened up and I was like, wow, I, I can do this on stage in front of people express myself not emotionally and it was a very exciting process and from that point on i loved it i loved it and um I did theater for six years before guiding light was the first tv show i'd ever done it was only supposed to be for three days and it turned into basically a 40-year career so it's kind of crazy amazing yeah and walt well you know i was a, i was a sculpture major i was a fine arts major in college and working in page makeup at the um college newspaper and I was pasting up an article that they were uh, holding auditions for Frankenstein. And I'd always been a horror film fan. I'd done a play, maybe two, but I think just one in high school. And I thought, my gosh, wouldn't it be fun to play Dr. Frankenstein? Well, I was cast as the creature. And uh, <laughs> it was, it was uh, an interesting take. It wasn't the bolts in the neck and the flat head and stuff. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, notices, if you can call them that, were pretty good. Did like four more plays that year, um, was done with college then, worked a variety of jobs. The last job I think was as director of sales administration for a manufacturing company, got a call from a kid who was still at the college. He was now uh, tenured faculty. So it was that long had passed. Uh, he had been a student when I was a student that they were casting for Dracula doing a show called The Passion of Dracula. And I thought, wow, play the creature, play Dracula. That's kind of cool. So I went and I auditioned and got it. Uh, that was at the beginning of their summer, their summer company that year. Uh, I did that. I did four or five shows the next year, the summer company the year after that. Then I, I thought, geez, I was, I was getting close to, you know, 30 years old at that point in time. And I thought, wow, I don't want to turn 40 and wonder what if I would have and have that hell to live with the rest of my life. So sold on everything I owned and moved to New York, uh, lived in Elmhurst, Queens, and uh, didn't see the stuff on the Ross report that said, don't phone or come and started phoning people and dropping by. And uh, I remember I called Suzanne Ringrose, who was the assistant casting director at All My Children. And, uh, you know, there's a big, all caps says, don't phone or come, you know. Well, I called, because I guess I didn't read that far. I got excited there was a phone number there. And I called and she had me in and gave me a day's work right there. And I worked, like I said, I was 
Adam's jet pilot. I was Palmer's limo driver. I was the Mater D. At, what was the name of the restaurant there? Uh, uh, not the goalpost, but the other one, the Chateau or the Chalet or something like that. I was, you know, I had the cops and, and all kinds, ate burgers at the goalpost. I mean, so I was around that set for a long time. But I, I guess the actor that influenced me most, I remember I was in college, I wanted to get, I had long hair, which I, I again have, because I haven't been to a, I have like Jackson 1988 hair here. Uh, but um, uh, I can remember going somewhere to get my hair cut and having a picture of, <laughs> this is embarrassing, having a picture of Clint Eastwood and Dirty Harry and saying, this is how I want my hair. So maybe it was maybe it was uh, maybe it was Eastwood who influenced it me. Was I don't know. I think it was probably it, it, Dick Van Dyke. I've always felt that it, if Dick Van Dyke and Clint Eastwood had a child, it would probably be me. So I'm thinking. Uh, uh, Walt, can I say something? Out real quick? I want to share something. Walt, I don't know if you yeah. remember this, but because we had worked together for those few shows on Guiding Light, right. it was soon after that I ran into you at a club on 14th Street one night with a bar. And you had just gotten the part on All My Children, and you were sharing that with me. Oh, yeah. yes, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, because that's we knew each other because we had worked together, and I right. was there. And you told me that you said I just landed this part. You told me you were going to be working with Susan. I was like, awesome, man! You were very excited about it. That was awesome. It was wow. very exciting, and and I I never auditioned for it, which I thought was the odd thing. I'm not sure anybody did. I had auditioned yeah. for something else there and didn't get it uh i think it was the the new jeff martin i think um oh. and didn't get that and then i was i just uh just getting ready to go in to an audition for a, a horrible thing on lifetime called our group about a therapy group um and uh and called my agent and she said oh well it's jackson montgomery i said no honey it's walt willie i think you would remember me you know what kind of age are you and she said, no, I just got off the phone with Jackson Montgomery. You're starting six weeks or so. And I thought, well, this is great. I didn't care about this audition I was about to walk into at all. And actually, I aced it because I didn't care. That's the trick. Don't care. And uh, so I did six weeks there and then went right on children after a nice tune-up fight kind of thing. But I can, you know, it was just, uh, uh, you know, getting something that you have an audition for. Was that the case? Well, yeah, you, Jacob, you, you said you just got a call, right? Uh, as a call for well, you sorry, did an audition for Jr. For right? Jr. Well, 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 yeah, no, yeah. So, so there, there, there was uh, an audition for both. And the interesting, the interesting part of the story, actually, that I didn't tell just a bit earlier, was that um, um, uh, you know uh, uh, Justin Bruning, who played Jamie, sure. Was originally cast as Jr. Unbeknownst to me, and at the same time, they were asking me, like, "Do you want to play Tad Martin's son, or do you want to play Adam Chandler's son?" And and I I was like, "Well, I want to play Adam Chandler's son." And they had already cast, you know, Justin in the role. Ooh. So I recently we recently did a, the, this uh, Entertainment Weekly uh, sort of grouping thing, and I think right. we probably were part of that as well. Right. And, um and we i i did one with uh justin he told that story oh no and of course um, you know he you know um not quite sure he ever got over that uh but uh, <laughs> because <laughs> that I, I why he doesn't like you, I, anyway. you, you know why he doesn't like you now it was well I, you know look, look you know <laughs> you know, it, you know I, I he was cast as one role then one day they were telling him he's playing you know jamie martin so Boy. Uh, so that was, uh, so, but it, but my, you know, my first day, not first day, um, the question your biggest was, influence. Is, uh, your biggest influence on becoming it, an actor. It, it yeah, right. Um, so it, and this is the truth. I was in the third grade and, you know, you know, every, you know, like in, in, in elementary school, there's always the big Christmas pageant parade, you know, for, you know, the, the show that most elementary schools mm -hmm. do. And I remember that there was like four kids that were up for all these different speaking roles. And I took it upon myself to memorize all the roles, girls, boys, didn't matter. And I found myself critiquing them. And the teacher <laughs> found out that I was like 
you know, that I knew that I knew all their parts. And one of the kids ended up getting um, not being eligible to do it. He was for some reason gone. And I was suddenly like thrown into this role. Right. And I was like, oh, I know this role. I know all of the roles. And interestingly enough, his name was Jacob Phillips the kid that I was replacing. And the part that I had to introduce was, hello, I'm Jacob Young, and I'm introducing the three happy Christmas trees. <laughs> and of course I said, the night of, I said, hello, I'm Jacob Phillips. <laughs> and I'm introducing the happy three Christmas trees. <laughs> and everybody like there was like some chuckles and laughs of course the kids they knew that i messed up and and uh, i had i literally like i was like it was my first uh, emotional like breakdown like realizing that i cared about the craft so much and i cared about it you know what i was doing so much and um it, it, it you know it was a very traumatizing moment but at the same time it was a very like it was an eye-opening experience now that I look on it later on in life. That's, it, it was really what, what started that whole passion inside of me was in the third grade. That's great. Uh, have you ever had oh, the, um, who, um, who an actor like that you have always uh, looked up to? Well, who do you, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> What'd you I say? Who do you like acting better, Jacob? Jacob Phillips or Jacob Young? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, I'm 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 pretty fond of the Jacob Young character. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Guys, yeah, yeah, no, what what you your, you know, um, it'd be interesting to know, like, who do you look look up to as an actor, though, like out there, whether it be when you were younger that well, made you get into acting, or even now. Well, that's that's a good question, and um, I think like a lot of you guys right here, um, and we all we kind of I mean I know, um, one day I, I was I was at a, a diner with my dad, an old diner, smoky people were still smoking and you know in the but diners back then and <clears throat> and um, and my dad said something to me like he's like uh, you know you remind me of James Dean, do you know who that is? And I did like suddenly I was like, hey, yeah. <laughs> this sounds like stupid thing. And, you know, I already I think I already was, you know, realizing that I wanted to be an actor at that point. But, you know, uh, I eventually, you know, like, like any young actor, I was like James Dean, Steve McQueen, Marlon Brando, you know, uh, you know, on and on. Like those guys, like you just, you know, I was watching growing up and going, you know, I could do that. You know, I, I know I could do that. And then I like. I, I started watching this show called Saved by the Bell. Do you guys know that show? <laughs> sure. it's, a good, it's a good show. It's a good show. Amazing it's show. It's coming back. It's coming back. I, I know. I know. I know. I'm, and I'm a little upset <laughs> about that because I'm not involved in it. But um, <laughs> but I started watching a show called Saved by the Bell. And I was like, shit, I could do this. These guys could do that. I could do this. And, and that's finally, you know, my mom said, you know, she goes to me, she goes, well, you know, you're working at Denny's, you know, waiting tables, you're in high school, maybe uh, Aaron Spelling will come in and you'll wait on him. <laughs> and I said, I said, mom, Aaron Spelling doesn't go to Denny's. You know, he's a massive producer in Hollywood, right? He doesn't eat at Denny's. She's like, well, but you've always been so handsome. So I said, oh, thanks, mom. I appreciate that. <laughs> You're, you're a biggest fan. You're a biggest fan. Speaking of I'm speaking biggest. of fans, speaking of fans, uh, the fan February shows you guys used to do. Um, uh, Michael E. Knight, I, did, did he talk to the camera and say something about you, Aiden, that turns to the camera and says, I can't understand what he's saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Were those, no, were those fun to do? With him every were those day. fun to do? Were those fun to do? What was what fun the to fan, do exactly? The fan, the fan oh, yeah, February absolutely. days. Yeah, the fan February days. Um, and, and also there, there was another time with Bob Guinea that uh, Rebecca Buddy got was married to for a while. That was one of the bachelors. And um, 
uh, we used to do like uh, not Sunday fun days, but um, you know, once super a month we would, they would fly us. No, we were super soap every yeah every November at, at Disney World in Florida. Yeah, we we would do fun in the sun. That's what it fun was. We would take I us to Miami them. and stuff. So that was also yeah. you know working all week with these amazing hardworking actors that um, learn all these lines like day in and day out, like you guys you know did and and um, helped me do. We we also got to do fun things uh, you know like fun in the sun and uh, super soap weekend and that you know when you know how many people are watching the show and how much they love your characters you know it just makes it all worth it you know because uh, i don't know if anybody knows this but you know in the acting industry it's like glitz and glamour everywhere and we're all stars right and everybody wants to be an actor but my experience uh working at all my children was was amazing you know got to meet many great people like you and uh, you know cameron matheson and and Susan Lucci and everything, but um, if you needed a glass of water because you you were nervous or something, or you know if you were weren't feeling very well, it was it it didn't really matter. You had to just say words and and then you can leave and learn your next words and come in the next day. So it's, it wasn't glamorous. It was like it was the Marines of acting, and uh, I I just remember how how much of a um yeah sort of a, a shovel in the face that was the first first year it was like we're not here to you know to be to mess around we are here to 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 work hard and to get the day done and it is very hard to get you know an uh 42 minutes of uh stuff speaking of that the marines of reiterate day, that. the marines of daytime what what would you consider at all my children um would would have been like the hardest thing you you were tasked to do whether it was 70 pages i mean I, vince and i just because i i didn't watch all my children but i just happened to watch before this your scenes um with susan lucci reliving your father's um suicide i think um by 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 marge uh, vanessa's telling of the story <laughs> Yes. you know and and that that blew me away that you know yes. the amount of the amount of material you had for that was amazing yeah you know what's great about those scenes though or is that we were in that set for several days and it felt like we were doing a movie because it was just the two of us except for at the end where Vanessa is like lurking on the stairwell overhearing everything yeah. but prior to that it was just the two of us and it it really did feel like we were doing a film because it was so intense and the build up to that final huge monologue. Um, it, it really was exciting. But I'll tell you this I mean, from the first day that I worked in daytime, when I first got my job on, on Guiding Light, and I got the script, the script the night, two days before, and it was like 35 pages, which years later we were doing 60, 70 pages some days because we'd be doing show, scenes from three six, six different shows. Um, at a time on one set, perhaps. Um, but at that time, my first time getting that, that script, I was a little overwhelmed. I was like, holy crap, I've got to do this in, in two days. Um, but we did it. I did it. And then the next script, I was three days, as I said. And I came to the conclusion that it always gets done. You know, at the end of the day, everybody goes home. And it took, it took away a lot of the anxiety for me because I said, I can do this, I know I can make it happen, but it always felt for me like the myth of Sisyphus, you know, where you're pushing that boulder up the, to the top of the, the, the hill at every day, you're pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, and then you get up there and you stop and take a sigh of relief, you wipe the sweat off your brow, and the freaking thing goes rolling back down the hill, because the next day you got to start all over again from that same place. That's what I always felt like working in daytime, but it was very rewarding at the same time. At least I yeah. got to take a sigh of relief and wipe the sweat off my brow. You know, I we 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 all had some some wonderfully emotionally based stuff I think to do, but I played the DA, which meant every so often a long uh, trial, yeah. <laughs> and with that trial usually came an eight to twelve page summation to the jury. It was often about yeah. a story that I had nothing to do with, <laughs> and I've got all the A team sitting in the in the courtroom watching me do it, and uh, boy, I hope he gets through it. 
you know, and I used to, I used to work more on those monologues than anything else because sure. you know, when when you're doing a, a you know you and another actor and it's give and take, maybe you don't want it to be so locked down and it's not necessarily so factually based, and you want to be able to have some fun, you know, and and actually be there in that moment. Not so much when you're doing a twelve page summation to the jury. Um, and you know and and meanwhile you're getting four shots the entire time because they're doing reaction shots of everybody all over the courthouse so you know it's like well, why don't you take my shots i'll say those words then i'm going to go stand by this microphone and just read the rest of this thing can we do it that way well no we couldn't do it that way but uh, that 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 to me was the was the toughest stuff and if you can do i think if you can do that i i i you know i'm i go along with you aiden it it is kind of the Marines, I, I used to think, think of us as like the blue collar workers of, you know, uh, the entertainment industry in that, you know, we're there every day, uh, some days nine to five, some days seven to two in the morning, you know, and like Vincent says, you leave when it's done. It's not, we very seldom put a thing off. Oh, we'll pick it up tomorrow. It was no, we have to get this done today. because Tomorrow we've got parts of six shows, you know. Um, right. What, what happens in well, at the end of the day, and it comes to twelve o'clock, and you, you know, it's it's all done, and then uh, you haven't had time to learn the next day. So what happens then? I mean, talking as a fan, now, yeah, I mean, what what do you have to do? I was going to say you don't know the answer. That <laughs> you know what you do? You stay up all night and hope you're not called at yeah. eight o'clock. You know, hope you've got an afternoon yeah. call. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, I, yeah. I, I, always, I, always I don't think like, a lot of people know years. about that. How hard yeah. people work on sites yeah. they just oh, right. everything it teaches you you know it's uh, you want to be an actor okay well great it's not all about glitz and glamour it's uh you not have to put in the time. <laughs> especially if, uh, if you can do daytime you can do anything it's not the other way if you can do a movie that's not you know yeah, if, if you can you, do daytime you, you can have do the it. patience to sit on a set or in your trailer waiting for the I did this, I'm, I played Wild Bill for, for this thing called Gunslingers on, on the American Hero channel, yeah, in 2013, 2014, I'm not sure uh, which, and you know, these guys moved along. This was, not, you know, it was a pretty cheap production, but I mean, they, they weren't spending a lot of money. They were doing five or six shoots at one time with different crews and different companies, different, because they did, I think like eight different episodes. So they were shooting like three of them at one time in different places. But even that was like, oh my, these are the longest days in the world sitting around waiting, sitting around waiting, trying to keep my mustache from drooping, you know, sitting around, <laughs> sitting around waiting. I mean, you're trying to scratch through the wig, you know, sitting around waiting. It's just, I so missed the speed at which we did things, you know. I, I that sure. was a, you know, we did a play a day. I don't know about a movie, but we certainly did a play a day. And I, that's what I really, that's, I mean, that was part of why I stuck around, you know, daytime for 27, 28 years was because I like to go to the ballpark and I like to get paid for it, you know, and yeah. that's kind of like it was, you know, you go to the ballpark, whether you're playing in the big game or not, you're on the field and, and, you know, you get paid for it. So it's kind of a good deal. Do you have a favorite story at all my children, Jacob? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, there's, there's several stories, but, um, one that when you guys were talking about, it was a, a storyline that brought to my mind, uh, was with Susan and Eden Regal. And it happened to be this reveal when I found out that, uh, Colin Egglesfield's character was, uh, sleeping with my wife and he decided to fall off the wagon and it was these really strangely intense scenes of me being drunk in this hotel room with with uh, Eden Regal's character and, and Susan, of course. And and I ended up jumping out the window. And um, for some reason, those scenes to me they just stick the most in my mind. It was um, it was the probably the the, the most emotionally intense monologues and it was just monologue after monologue after monologue and you guys all know these monologues you know well you know doing all the law you know the law stuff and these monologues they can go on and on and on sometimes three four pages and i was looking at that work going like how the hell am i going to get through this and how am i going to keep this intensity 
you know, and I just shot four shows in the last two days. Um, and so, you know, I, I just, you know, it was like one of those late nights, grinned and bared it. And I just kept finding little nuances and I kept writing little notes to myself. And, and those scenes, to me, they, um, you know, they stick out in my mind. They were just really powerful. Susan executed such amazing performance as she always does. Eden was amazing as she always does. And it was, it was just fun to play. It was hard to play, but it was fun to play and it was rewarding. And, uh, uh, those, those scenes stick out the most, I think. In my you know, the, we talk about these long monologues and stuff. What, 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 what was the, wasn't one of the worst things when you had a three, four page monologue and you're up at the end of the day and they go well you know what we're running long so we're going to cut and end up cutting like three of the five pages oh, you know what, how am i supposed to get from here to there now i, I, I very but that that was another thing I, again we only had 42 minutes and sometimes they write an hour 12. you know yeah and you had to pick up the pace and it had a lot of things ended up being cut or cut in edit. Well, that's that's the other um genius of your talent because you'll find out 10 minutes before you're going on set that this, no, this, and this. Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Two minutes. I literally, yeah. all of a sudden, it's like the stage manager goes, um, what? Okay. They walk up to you and they literally take their pin and they draw a fucking line through their script. <laughs> <laughs> the entire One page. The last two page. Three, four hours. Yeah. And it's like, this page is gone. This page is gone and this page is gone. And you're like, so all I'm saying is goodbye now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the worst part is when they did that after dress rehearsal, then they come out and do this. What, is this about how I did it? No, we're, no, we're long. Oh, sure. <laughs> <Tell me. laughs> Walt, do you have a favorite story? Uh, I, you know, I loved the whole, um, when Levin Rambin was on and the Lily thing, I had... I had quite a, bit, quite a few things going on in my life that were, you know, very much like that. My son may or may not, it's impossible to say, to this day have Asperger's. And so, you know, which in those days was considered on the spectrum. It's not, I understand, anymore. And Chance is doing really well. If that's what being on the spectrum means, then Dave, I'm going to find myself a position on the spectrum because he's brilliant mm -hmm. and just an incredible young man. And but that I thought was was such a such an important story to tell. And that's when I started to believe that, that they really did have microphones in our dressing room. Some of them we we know there were microphones, <laughs> but some we just suspected uh, because things would go on at home. And uh, and I would, uh, you know, and I come in and the next day I'd be reading that thing that went on at home. And, you know, uh, and and also with Reggie, with. Uh, Michael B. Jordan, who was, you know, uh, th that I thought was just uh, uh, also just, you know, J Jack was a better man than I ever was. And I learned a lot from Jack. And I'm really grateful for that. He was a really good guy. And uh, and Michael Jordan, I used to, uh, uh, he, he lived in Hobo, uh, in uh, Newark. Newark. He lived in Jersey City. And so his mom would drop him off at the donut shop and I'd pick him up there and we'd ride back and forth you know, to and from work. So we got to be really tight really quick. Uh, and it was great because we were playing father and son. And, you know, here I was not married with a daughter and a son, you know, both of them adopted. Um, it was, it, it was, those were interesting stories and not very soapy. And did you uh, know he'd be Michael B. Jordan? Oh, you know, I, I did I know that? No. Was I surprised? Not in the least. Yeah, <laughs> I talked to well, him. Well, did, I mean, didn't, didn't, didn't he go to? Didn't go to? Um, he, he went to a prestigious high school, right? A, a arts high school. He had a, a grant to. Yes. He was. Yeah. He was and studying he early had, on. And didn't he? Did he not? Did he not go to Juilliard as well? I don't believe Michael did. I I think we got him kind of because he was. No, I don't think so. I think he went after children. I think he went to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I could be wrong about that. Um, but what he did have was a terrific. But he, he was doing the wire, though. He was yeah, he, he was doing the wire on. I think yeah, he was doing the wire also while he was working. Yeah. But yeah, his, his yeah. mom was terrific, and I knew it was going to go well for him because the minute he got out to Los Angeles, and kind of hit, he moved his mom out, 
And I thought, how yeah. smart is that? You know, he was only maybe 18 or 19 when he started to hit with this stuff. I thought, how smart is that? You know, continue that wonderful relationship, that respectful thing, and know that there's somebody who's absolutely in your corner, no matter what happens out there. You come home, there's somebody there that's going to be in your corner. And I, I, I think I that's be my mama early. That, that was my maybe my biggest downfall. What was? I said, I said I tried to kick my mom out early. That was my biggest thing. <laughs> <laughs> and what you you mentioned Chance, you got to perform yeah. with him, didn't you? Oh, several times. Yeah, after uh, I, I guess twenty four times. I, I did. Well, Vincent did one. In fact, I would every summer do these plays in my hometown of Ottawa, yeah. Illinois. Uh, Vincent j joined us for uh, Harvey. And let's see who else did it with us. Jill Larson oh, yeah. did it with us. Um, uh, Julia Barr, um, Taylor Miller, Kale Brown. Did Bobby uh, Eakes did one too? Bobby Eakes did Death Trap with us. Chance and, 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 and she and, 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 but so I bring these things and we do these shows once a year. And then in 2014, I moved back there and I started a children's learning theater, which was the best seven hours I spent any week was doing that. It was fantastic. It was just so much fun. Um, and, uh, um, and what was your question? I was getting around to the answer. No, I'm just, just saying, because you, you, you mentioned you oh. mentioned Chance and just getting the opportunity to work with oh, him. Oh, yeah. So we did, my God, we did uh, Our Snake and Old Lace together. He was Billy Bivitt when we did um, One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. He played George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. He did Rote in um, uh, Wait Until Dark. And, you know, to, and he and I had such a wonderful shorthand because I directed or, or co-directed most of those. And we had such a wonderful shorthand. I could just say a thing to him and he's got it. And he was the best, all fatherly pride aside, he, he was one of the most talented young actors I ever worked with. And the best, he was so good at taking notes. He'd take it, made sure he understood it. He'd integrate it. You never had to worry about that again. You know, he was, he was terrific, That's right. just terrific. That's great. Vincent, do you have a favorite story at All My Kids? Um, well, the different type of stories, I I loved all the, the character storylines that were given to me. They were always very exciting. Um, but I will share a few little moments that happened. Um, one was with uh, Josh Dumel and Mark Suelos, and it was this big scene with Marge Doucet had this like five page monologue in the restaurant there, and it was like you know the cast of like fifteen actors on there, and and also extras, and Mark had a line across the room from Josh and I, we were standing there, Marge was in the middle. He had this line and he said it, but it came out like he kind of bumbled it a little bit. And they, and when he did it, he was like, oh, that's not what I was kind of saying, what I, that, and then they kept going. And you could see in his eyes, he looked at us, at me and Josh, and Josh and I, we were in tears. We were trying desperately not to break because March had another three pages of monologue, and it was an intense, crazy monologue as Vanessa had often. And Mark was looking at us. He was trying not to laugh. This went on for literally about like six minutes, and we were just like covering our faces, trying not to be on camera. We were about to pee our pants. It was that funny. And after they said cut, we just lost it, just totally lost it. Um, Another thing that I will never forget with James Mitchell, whom I love and have such great respect for, became dear friends with him. We go to see uh, plays at Palmer Cartland. Um, yeah, Palmer Cartland. And um, my first time meeting him was when I was playing Lou Jack, actually. And we used to do appearances all the time, especially back then <laughs> in the games. Every weekend we'd go on appearances. The, the work weeks were so intense. And every Friday night, most of the actors, and I know in all my children, they were doing it too, because I would run into them at bars. We'd all get like pretty hammered, you know, getting crazy. We were young, wild, having fun. And I had an appearance what? the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> the next morning, <laughs> what was that? What? What? What are you talking about? So the next morning, I had, I, had to, I had an appearance and I had to um, drive to, to New Jersey. And I didn't wake up for my, on my, <clears throat> my wake up call for it and people were banging on my door of my apartment and I finally wake up and he goes there's a limo downstairs waiting for us oh, can you tell him I'll be right down I was like still kind of feeling from the night before jumped in the shower went downstairs opened the door and James Mitchell was sitting there waiting <laughs> and 
you know, at that time I knew who he was, you know, Palmer with the Jenny Greg storyline, the whole thing, and, and the other storylines too, that were there, Nina and uh, I can't remember the name right now. But Cliff, I knew Cliff and Nina. Cliff and Nina. I knew him. Yeah. I mean, he was kind of like, you know, daytime royalty and actor. And I was like, walked in, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And he says, it's all right, just get in. So I'm like, oh, great. It was a long drive to New Jersey. <laughs> We did the appearance, drove back, and again I apologized. It was like, okay, that's fine. You can leave now, basically. <laughs> it was like, so that was 1984. Okay. Flash forward to my first day going working on set on all my children. It was supposed to be a three three month job. I walk into the makeup room and I see see James Mitchell sitting there in the chair. And I walk up to him. This is now 1997, 1997. Okay, so all these years later. I walk up to him and said, I said, James Mitchell, um, I'm so happy I'm going to get to work with you. And I'm like, I don't know if you remember me. And he looks at me and goes, oh, I remember you. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, oh, really? Really? Oh, All I remember these you. <laughs> I wow. left this indelible impression upon him. And it wasn't the most favorable impression, unfortunately. But we did become dear, dear friends. I adored him. I, I loved him. I, I, have right. that, Vincent, I have to add to that, Vincent. I have to add to that because... Um, you know, in, in James's later years, uh, you, you and I, we had taken him to a Broadway show together. Yeah, we went wasn't to dinner together. Yeah. It wasn't a doubt. Exactly. And yeah. Yeah. We went and saw doubt. Uh, and, yeah. um, and James was, you know, you know, I, you know, he was, you know, at that time, you know, he was, you know, he was already pretty old and we were, you know, we were there, you know, we had to walk across the street and regardless of that, yes. Um, my story is I, I, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to do Beauty and the Beast on Broadway. And if it wasn't for James directly, if not indirectly, I would have never been hired for that show. And, um, how so you know, he just, uh, well, so, so, uh, so James was friends with the managing producer of Beauty and the Beast. And we had just finished doing the All My, we, we had done the Equity Fights AIDS Broadway Cares uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us participated in that. We sang, and I had done a number from Rent. I know, Vincent, you performed there, didn't you? Yeah, I, did. so I went from Jekyll and Hyde and another one from It's a Clear Day. Um, that was the next year. Yeah. I did all I, and all, all it, I care about is love for, from Chicago. Yeah. Right, exactly. That's right. right. It was it was a sold out show. It was lots of people there. I had no idea who was in the audience, but um, one of the you know the managing producer from Beauty and the Beast on Broadway was there, and he saw me do the performance. And then I, we, we we were celebrating at the Rainbow Room at Thirty Rock. It was yeah. fucking amazing. It was like you know suddenly I'm, you know and you know. I, uh, yeah, I'm Al Pacino. I'm dancing across this floor, and I'm hanging out. And all of a sudden, like um, the the floor rotates around, and it's like right near Jimmy's, you know. Because if, if people don't know, like the Rainbow Room had this like revolving yeah. uh, dance floor. dance floor, dance floor. Yeah. Like you know, I'm dancing and dancing, and all of a sudden, I'm I'm by you know Jimmy's table, James Mitchell's table, and he's like, "Hey, why don't why don't you come sit down? I want to introduce you to my friend." Um, and he introduced me to my buddy, Mark Rizzano, who both of you, all of you know, and, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, you know, Mark saw you perform and he thinks you might be great for Beauty and the Beast on Broadway. And it all took place. Well, you know, it wasn't just his decision. Of course, it was lots of, lots of people's decision at Disney. Um, but it got me in the door. I auditioned like four times for the role. I mean, they shut me down the first time. Said no, then the second time came back. But regardless, it happened. But it happened because of James Mitchell. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Aiden, I'm going to get to to your favorite story. But Jacob, what was it like making your Broadway debut in that show? Uh, well, it was it was like a, a dream come true, but it was, but at the same time, the scariest thing of my entire life. It was, I, I remember the very first opening night for me, uh, which would have been my opening night. And, you know, the castle pushes forward. I was playing Lumiere. All the opening sequence has already started suddenly in this fire retardant suit with 
butane packs on my back, gas in my hand, uh, like you could going, that. oh my God, face down. And my heart's just pounding through my chest. And, you know, the applause just started as soon as the castle started moving forward and Cogsworth and Lumiere's mm -hmm. exposed. And, and all of a sudden it just became like, like I was like light on your feet, like you just couldn't, you know, like you're floating. It became like, like I didn't realize I was doing what I was doing. And then I can't re even remember the moment exactly. It just, it's just that spectacular to be on that kind of stage with, you know, a 23 piece orchestra, one of the last in Broadway history. Yep. And, um, and also performing the longest song in Broadway history. Be Our Guest is a marathon yeah. of a number. And I don't, I, I wish- work, I worked on the movie. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I did, did PR you? on the movie. Yeah, it's uh that that is quite a character to be able to portray. So bravo! bravo yeah, he did. He did a great Thank job. I went to see him about three or four times just to make amazing. sure that he, he had it down. And you you were you were going to help him out. <laughs> yeah, I just want to make sure. Well, it's, and that, and, you know, um, I think I paid for a ticket once, and then you know, and then Mark was like, "Hey, we're gonna." I met Mark and then Jacob introduced me to Mark and he said, well, you want to come and see him? I said, well, I've already seen the show. He's like, well, no, well, come with me and you see, we see it from a different angle. It's different from a different angle. You know that, right? And then so I'd see it from, you know, and we just kept going to see it. I didn't have to pay for it anymore. And uh, I see my buddy at the end of the week, um, um, you know, do such a great job. It, it was, it was great. It was awesome. Oh, we, was also really got to, we also got to hang out afterwards, which was always a, a blast. Yeah. Yeah, so you do your work all week on all my children. They go and they go there. Go see a Broadway show. Eight, eight nights a week. I mean, I remember you. Uh, you were, it got. You know, you got very tired. Doing double. Du you were doing after. double duty. Yeah, like three three months of that, and you know, you, you know, you could you could That's tell awesome. it was trying to starting to uh take take it yeah, it, it definitely definitely made me very tired it was uh, i was doing both and of course abc it's weird because abc and disney you know even though they're the same company they rarely communicate with other departments and yeah. um uh, this true. was sort of a, a synergy situation that they you know they didn't realize and then when abc daytime realized i was doing that they decided that they were going to work me twice as much on all my children so it was like <laughs> Yeah. It was like I, I mean I literally I remember um, I, I remember uh, I was like we were doing a court scene I think it was a court scene and I was I was being you know uh, I was def uh, defending myself because I was being accused which I was planning to kill my wife and and of I course. ended up um, you know, I, was, I basically fell asleep during the during you know <laughs> taping I fell asleep with my head on head on the desk. They were like, you got to wake up. It's your scene now. I was like, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Aiden, do you have a right favorite story? Oh, go ahead, Walt. No, 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 no. Go to my, my boy Aiden there. Yeah, I mean, I remember um, I had so many favorite scenes, so many favorite times. Um, Aiden Devane was an amazing character. I really enjoyed playing him, and uh, especially um, you know, over an eight-year period. If I was to think back, um, I remember Eva LaRue coming on um, – back on the show um um you know, rest in peace john callahan uh, uh uh husband and father of um her, her daughter and uh, but the she she had no memory and uh she was just that like lost person in pine valley and aiden devane was you know was there and happened to see her and uh take refuge on her and make sure that she was okay and then and then uh, ended up getting shot I remember coming up to the door at the Pine Cone Motel and uh, coming up to the door and then she'd open the door and then just falling down and having to do that, you know, do the scene you know, like eight times or whatever. And then she put me on the bed and uh, just to help me out. I was shot in the stomach. I remember that scene. That was, you know, that was a really, uh, it was a good, good memory. Another memory was <laughs> with Dax Shepard. Dax Shepard, um, well, actually, you know, sorry, there's one more. I mean, Jack Shepard was on all my children. No, no, I don't want to, um, I don't want to piss off John Callahan, but um, 
Yeah, there's a, a director, James. Uh, help me out, guys. James Farico. James, uh, a great guy. He used to it'd be a little heavy set, but a really, really nice guy. Oh, great um, guy. James uh, from, from Marico. No, no, no. That's anyway. This director was so just so into this <laughs> scene with me and Eva Larue, and it was like nine o'clock in the morning, and I think it was like, like I've been there a year and a half. And then Eva Rue is in her underwear. And then and what What am I going to do? I have to do this. And the blocking was I have to put her up against the wall. I have to kiss her and kiss her and then, and then put her on the bed. And I'm thinking, I don't, I don't remember signing up for this. And uh, I was just really, really yeah, nervous. Really it. nervous. Very nervous. And um, uh -huh. I was so nervous. I just felt like um, running out of the studio and just like running home, you know, never going wow. back. I knew at the time, I'm like, okay, right, this is the time. And then I have to man up and just do this like, uh, like you know. I remember him as a director, James, said, look, it's not you that has to kiss this girl. It's uh, it's Aidan Devane, okay? So so forget that you're married and forget that uh, yeah. all that stuff that you have in your head at home, you're not him, okay? So now... So now now you're him and this is your woman and you're she's in her underwear so so you what would you do if you were him and then so that that helped that was a great scene and one last <laughs> scene I, I forgot about that one you needed an awful lot of encouragement at it good director is it, it helps go in there and get it you couldn't come back one of us we would have helped you with that yeah, I, mean, I was really nervous, and, I, and I'm, you know, that, that gave me, um, I don't know, some some more confidence on, on the set the next day, going over that barrier. But I, I remember we're in a court scene, and what what is there is the DA, and um, um, Jr. is there, played by Jacob Young, uh, Jacob Young, and then um, Dax um, was there. I forget he, he was uh, he was also working for Walt Willie or whatever, or a lawyer or attorney. They we're all there in the court scene and everyone's there. Alicia Minshew playing Kendall, Cameron Matheson playing Ryan. Like everyone on the show is there. And then so all these people have all these lines and uh, I'm, I'm sort of um, there in the, in the witness stand or something. And, and then everybody has this line and I say, well, quite frankly, I couldn't give a rat's ass. And because of my accent, they stopped tape and stopped filming. <laughs> And they made every. They said no. It's uh, um, it's arse. You have to pronounce the uh, the r. You you got it wrong. It's arse. So everybody had to say all their lines again, and their monologues again. And they cut to me. And I, well, quite frankly, I can't. I couldn't give a rat's arse. And then in the control room, they said, you know what? That actually um, that doesn't sound right. No, um, just just say it as uh, uh, as ass. Okay, just say it as, as as you said it the first time. So everybody had to do the whole bloody thing again. Uh, you know, you must so have been good. sweating. You must have been sweating. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Quite frankly, I can't give a rat's ass. And then uh, like, and everything moved on and everything was fine after that. And I thought, well, why did everybody have to do it again? Were they not recording it? I mean, I don't know. Just, uh, That's funny. wow. I just have a couple more questions because I know you guys got to run. Um, oh, yeah. We have very big schedules, Alan. Very big schedules. <laughs> yeah. I've got to cut the back into my robe and babushka. I've got to go outside and take a breath of fresh air. Okay. Go. Okay. I, I don't want to take too much, but I'm, I'm very happy. I've got plenty more. Um, uh, people would be uh, upset if I didn't ask Vincent and, and Walt to share memories of Marge and Walt for you, Larkin Malloy. So, Vincent, if you want to – Talk, you know, first of all, Vincent, and I'd love to do another show with you and talk about Guiding Light because Vincent and I met, you know, because I was a big fan Absolutely. of Guiding Light. Um, but I yeah. mean, talk about mm -hmm. in a career to on Guiding Light to have a mother as Beverly McKinsey and then on all my right. children to have Marge Doucet. I mean, it's like it's a it's a wealth of riches for an actor. Absolutely. I would say that working with Beverly first, I didn't know who she was because I didn't really, I wasn't involved in the whole daytime community where I first started as Lou Jack. And, um, but her reputation absolutely preceded her. Before she even came on, people were constantly coming up to me and says, 
they just cast Mark, um, Beverly McKenzie as your mother. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Who's she? And she's like, she's like the only actress that ever had her name above a title of a soap. It was Texas. And she's like huge. She played Iris on Another World. And But yeah. we hit it off immediately when she first came on. I adored Beverly. And I love the scenes that they wrote for us. Some of my favorite scenes working on that show were my first scenes working with Beverly. Um, but then years later, when I came back as Nick, Beverly was on the show for about a year, and then she left the show, and they had to recast that role, which is not an easy thing to do, to recast the role of and the Beverly Marsh, yeah. Alexander. And it was about six, eight months later, they started reading people for it, and I had just, um, I'm trying to remember the timing of it. Yeah, so she came on, and she read for it, and she got the part, and she was brilliant. I, I knew who she was from Capital, I believe it was. Yeah, um, me too, I, yeah, I loved her on Capital. Catherine Hicklin, and I met her through her one time at like an event or something. Um, and I certainly knew her from that, but I, but getting to work with Marge, she was brilliant. I loved working with her. She, she could do crazy like no one else. And I just, the, just the memories that I have, even just seeing some of the videos that people post from YouTube with us, I just I have such fond memories of her and such great respect. But when I was working on all my children years later and they were going to cast my mother, Vanessa, I went down to Judy Wilson's office after they did some tests and I asked, um, who did you see and what did you, who did you like? She said, she told me some of the people and she said, March Doucet was definitely the person that we love. And I was like, oh my gosh, March. She played my mother on, on Guiding Light. And she's like, oh, I hope they're okay with that. And I'm like, Daytime is one big ensemble cast. I mean, it's like one it's one big repertory company, basically. So what does it matter if you play my mother on one show? That's a different character. She's the best in the role. They should definitely go with her. And she said, no, she's, you're right. And I, I will definitely pitch her because she was fantastic. And she got the part. And I, I mean, all of us can attest to it. But March was was brilliant in the role. And I just adored her. I mean, and she, you know, she went through some tough times when she was on the show. Her son passed away from AIDS, which yeah. was a really tough period of time for her um, during those months um, that he was ill. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I thought about her last September. I was in New York and I was just passing through and she came to my mind and I called her. I hadn't spoken to her in years. I just called her to say hello, just to see how she was doing. I was thinking about her and I could tell it meant a lot to her that, that I reached out this time had passed and I just wanted to see how she was doing. I, I heard that she was having well, she was ill. Um, so it wasn't a big surprise when we found out that she had passed, but I, I, I loved her and I just, you know, I feel very grateful and really blessed to have had the opportunity not only to know her, but also to work with her. She was great. I, I, I'm glad all my children didn't hesitate because, uh, you know, it's not only, it's also like a, a marketing or yeah. excuse the word opportunity because people who watched you on one show would love to see you play mother and sure. son again, of course, on another show. And Walt, yeah. Larkin, you know, people were asking about Larkin. Especially, I mean, honestly, yeah, honestly, the fact that she wrote, yeah, honestly, the fact that she even came on and replaced Beverly at that time, that was a Herculean task. That's not somebody of a character or an actress oh. that you come in, anybody can come in and replace them and and stand out. And she did yeah. do it. She did it fantastic. She did. You know? Correct. She there, there, are, there are some tough roles shoes to fill and that Beverly is definitely one of them. Yeah, yeah. Larkin, Larkin and I, uh, we, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, they couldn't find uh, anybody that actually looked like him to be his brother, I guess. We used to joke about, uh, you know, different fathers and different mothers. Um, but we, uh, uh, I actually had known Larkin for a while because he he played um, on Edge of Night. I can't remember his character, but I, I played a Swiss policeman on Edge of Night for a heartbeat. Uh, and uh, they, I guess his character is Sky, Skyler, Sky, I guess was his Sky, character. Sky, yeah, I think that's it. Sky, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, he snuck out a window on a uh, bathroom window on me or something. Anyway, so I, I'd known Larkin for some time. And we were good friends. You know, the, the, the old studio where I first started on 67 and Columbus there, we didn't have a lot of dressing room space. Uh, that changed when we went over toward the river there on 66th Street, but Larkin and I were also dressing roommates. 
So we played brothers, we were dressing roommates, we had a lot of scenes together. And uh, what the, one, one of my favorite things that comes to mind was kind of like the story you told about, about um, uh, Josh and Mark and trying to get through Marge's monologue after he, he had, he had yeah. this line Larkin did. He's coming down the stairs. Of course, he had to be coming down the stairs. He couldn't just be standing still. And, and the line was, Jackson, you're up to your neck in this thing. But he couldn't say it. He'd say, Jackson, you're up on your neck. Not on your neck. No, damn it. Hang on. I got this. <laughs> Jackson, you're in your... Where are you? No, you're in... Where are you? You're up. To, you're up. I'm, and I mean, 20 takes later, by this time, I can't stop laughing because he's getting red. Anybody that knows Larkin, when he got embarrassed, he got red. I mean, red, red. That Irish, like it's a tequila red. And he was getting redder and redder. <laughs> and it was funnier and funnier. And I just, you know, and finally, they just, all right, let's take five here, you know, because it just wasn't going to happen. But Larkin and I, we traveled together. We went on vacation together. We, you know, worked together. Um, we spent a lot of time. And he was... Uh, uh, Tommy, as as I called him, which was his real name, um, he was. Uh, oh wow! I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. Larkin, 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 Larkin all these actually, years, Larkin was I, actually his mother's maiden name. Oh hmm. wow! She she yeah, was, he was on Guiding Light. Names, so you know you put. Yeah, he was on Guiding Larkin, Light. Right? He played Kyle Sampson right. on Guiding Light. Exactly, exactly. Right. And we'd oh. go. We went to Aruba a couple times, you know, on vacation. And we just we just really enjoy each other, uh, and we're pretty good. Pretty good compliments to one another what he was wasn't good at i was and vice versa what i was terrible at he was very good at he was a, a an incredible gentleman of the old world style and uh really loved the craft taught the craft for years and years knew shakespeare you know something you don't find a lot anymore and i really admired that uh, he was, he came you know, over to my show to as the world turns to work with the younger talent that's right when goutman after there, yes, right? when Chris Gatman, yeah, when right. Gatman was executive producer, right. correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Larkin was he was he was, uh, and then he he and I did what back in 2013 or so we did um, Tainted Dreams uh, together. Yeah, and the web series. He played, essentially, he he played Henry. Uh, you all know who, who I'm talking. Henry Kaplan. Essentially, he was uh, channeling Henry, playing this director, and it was a very sweet wonderful kind of homage to Henry, who was, Henry Kaplan was uh, a director on All My Children, who had come out of a Saved Any Wednesday on Broadway. He'd been around for years. He was a terrific director, but his time on stage was during notes. That was his time on stage. And he'd give you notes. He'd look, look at you and go, and I just say, longest cross in the business, next note. You know, with no help or sexy as a fish, next note. And I mean, when I first started there, I had to stop an elevator between the floors and beg him. Just if I'm doing something wrong, please just tell me what it is. Because he just <laughs> look at you and go, next note. And I mean, he was saying, but he was one of the best hearted, biggest hearted people in, in the world. But boy, if you didn't know how he directed, you were in tears before lunch. I mean, it was hmm. just. Yeah, but Larkin was doing him. Uh, for those of you that know Henry, Larkin was basically doing Henry. Uh, oh, on that's the, great. It was, yeah, it was really great. It was really great. <laughs> hey, Jacob, um, you played J.R. Chandler, Rick Forrester, and Lucky Spencer. Like, I mean, it doesn't get, you know, much better than an actor coming on to three different shows, like into these, you know, core families. Like, did that register with you? Like, as you were, you know, cast in all of these? Uh, you know, it really didn't register with me till later in, you know, in life. It was, it was just sort of an ironic coincidence that, you know, I was, you know, had been cast as, as the son or the junior of all of those, those main, main leads of the shows. Um, needless to say, I had a great, uh, you know, you know, I was able to I was able to learn from obviously the best in the, the business. Yes. I mean, working with you know Tony Geary, a, a quick story, um, and and, I, and I'm going to give a quick ab abridged version of it because I love Gene Francis. You know, we are great friends, and I'm still great friends with Tony as well. 
But um, they both were very, very opposed to Lucky being recast in those days because Jonathan Jackson had, you know, had started as a child and had won, you know, consecutive back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back daytime Emmys for the younger actor category. And they just felt that nobody could replace him. And Wendy Rich, when she brought me onto the show, said, you know, we're gonna have to re we're gonna have to replace this character. Jeannie said no way. Tony said no way. And then eventually they said, well, it's gonna happen no matter what. Or you know, you know, you know, if you're not happy, then you know, maybe there's the door. And and <clears throat> that wasn't, you know, Tony said finally he goes he goes well, he goes I want to be a part of the casting process, and if I give my approval on it, then then that's okay. You know, I'll be all right with that. So of course. So I, you know, I screen tested with like nine other guys and, you know, I, it was my turn to go up and I did my scene with Tony and, and, you know, left it at that. Well, I ended up getting hired for the role and my first day on set was with Tony and was with Jeannie. And Jeannie was still not okay with, at that time with my character being cast. And so I had these, like, I had a three page monologue because suddenly I had returned back to, you know, you know, to, to uh, Port Charles. And suddenly I'm there and uh, I'm about a page and a half into my monologue and I flub on one of the lines and Jeannie, like, throws her hand. I'm, oh my God, I can't believe this. <laughs> and Tony, like, and her get in the biggest argument I've ever seen in daytime history without being on camera. And um, <laughs> we just say, we've all been there. We've seen people walk off set. She had to walk off set. Tony grabs me by the lapels and goes, hey, sometimes mom and dad fight. <laughs> <laughs> and I, mean, Very good. I got it. I got it. I know what I'm supposed to do now. Very good. And that was it after that. I mean, and then, you know, Jeannie and I became best friends and, and we're still best friends to today. But, you know, I get it. You know, they were very partial to, because it was a very cherished role, Lucky Spencer. Yeah. Uh, so, but that, but yeah. that's a true story. Yeah. yeah I, I well, hit Ryan's hope after Roscoe Bourne uh, playing Joe Novak. And Roscoe, there, there was one guy, I think, between Roscoe Bourne and myself. Uh, so I was actually, I think, the fourth incarnation of Joe Novak on Ryan's Hope. And this was a role that belonged to Roscoe. And, you know, Roscoe was maybe 5'8". I was 6'3". In those days, I don't think I'm quite 6'3 anymore. But and so and I was blonde. He was a little dark. I mean, it was, it was just it was just we didn't we looked nothing alike. And it was, you know, and people would come up to me and kind of give me that. I remember Daniel Pilon who was an actor on, on Ryan's Hope, played Max Dubuzak, my arch nemesis, as it turned out, came up to me and kind of looked at me up and down and said, well, you're not Roscoe. <laughs> no, I'm not. But it's- Oh my God. It's tough way. And I'm serious. serious. They don't know if he was just realizing that Roscoe really wasn't coming back or whether he kind of put <laughs> in my place or what. Wow. Um, I mean, my testicles are in my stomach anyway, so there's nothing you could have done to make it any work. But so it's, you know, and that's not coming into play, you know, Lucky Spencer, which is that's a whole other, you know, level. Sure. Of that. But yeah. when you come in as a recast, you know, you come in with the, with the, with the bones of what came before, you know, and you have to, you know, you have to integrate them somehow or just ignore them totally. But, you know, the minute you integrate them, you start down that road and then, you know, maybe you don't want to go down that road very far. And so that, but, yeah, it's, it's it's tough. So my hand has always been off to you, Jacob, about that. That's you know, three of those is tough. That's a big recast, man. Yeah, it's a big. It, it yeah. really is. Three recast yeah. for sure. And three, and, and I have a big hello from your friend Carla Mosley, who I worked with on Guiding Light. She oh, says I to say hello. hello. What a Wonderful. what a yeah. um, what what an amazing story that was to tell in daytime. A transgender character. I mean. Well, how did you yeah, feel? Yeah, it, it, it was. You know, I remember reading. Uh, well, at first, I didn't know. It was all very secretive. Like, there was, she was the only one that was privy to the storyline. And, you know, and we had been working closely and we'd become friends. But um, I didn't know that she knew what the storyline was going to be. And this is also a true story. I'm sitting in the, in you know, I'm, I, she's sitting in the makeup chair. I just had come into the makeup room. And you guys know that, that scenario. You know, everybody's like in there. You're, everybody's talking, hanging out. And um, 
and I had overheard that, you know, a little bit more about this story. And I saw Carla there and I was like, you know, cause I, I had basically at this point had been in daytime for 18 years or whatever, 15, 16 years. And I was like, I, I, I there's not a storyline I haven't seen or heard or read. And, you know, I jokingly said, I said, well, what are they going to do? They're going to make you a man. <laughs> and she like went, she was looking at me <laughs> and I was like, what? Really? I, I couldn't believe I even like get, guessed it. And, and then I was like, then my biggest concern was like, if they're going to go there, we have to make sure that everybody, you know, the, the story is told appropriately. And yeah. so, you know, that was, you know, my biggest concern. I said, w where do you guys plan to go with this? Are we going to, are we going to be able to tell the story truthfully? And so that's when we were able to get the, you know, the head of, um, uh, you know, the Glad, Glad and LGBT and, and everybody, the presidents that came in. And I said, look, I'm, I'm naive. I don't know what the right words are to say regarding a transgender. I don't understand what I'm supposed to be saying. Do the writers understand all this? Um, we're really kind of treading on sensitive territory. So we actually sat around the board meeting at Bold and the Beautiful with everybody, the producers, the writers, and um, it, what was what was really the most eye-opening moment for me, and I have to say this truthfully from the heart, and I have to share this, is you know he was such a, a wonderful man who's educating us, and he said, "Well, I know this personally because I was a woman, and I just couldn't believe it because I was like I was like I, he didn't look any different than me. He had a, you know full beard, and you know I was just like." So like all of a sudden I was like, wow, I get it. I understand this. I know what it means to want to be your own unique individual and what has been inside of you. And so, you know, then of course there was the backlash. Well, why didn't you just hire a transgender to play the storyline? Why didn't you do that? And then Carla had to field all of those questions. And that was really, really difficult for her, but she handled it magnificently. Yeah, and, she's a, she's a um, class class act. But I mean, that I mean, I, kudos to Bold, Bold and the Beautiful for um, just putting you in that boardroom because all of you as actors, if you're going to tell a story like that, you want to be telling it with the accuracy that it deserves. And, and yeah. speaking, uh, and speaking of that, I mean, like especially a story like that, you know, you have all been in daytime. For, for, for years, you have told stories, you, you know, Vincent, Jacob, and Walt, uh, I think Aiden's having trouble connecting. You've traveled the country meeting your fans. Can you share some stories from fans about, I mean, Walt, the story with Lily must, must have resonated with, with the audience at home, you know? Are there things that stand out about a connection with, you know, meeting fans or something they've shared with you? You know, I, I, I had the uh, ideal s situation of getting to meet, uh, meet fans. You know, I did stand-up comedy for like 20 years. And meeting them at Disney, which was a fantastic thing. I loved that. Or meeting them after a, a, a personal appearance was one thing. But seeing them after they'd had some laughs and, you know, some of the barriers have broken down. Um, two, two stories come to mind that they, they uh, felt very strongly about mostly positive the people that felt negatively negatively about it felt really negatively about it one was you know bianca being gay and coming out and having her girlfriend and us actually showing all this which was again uh i'm i'm gonna guess that that was much like what was going on with you at bold and the beautiful jacob there were experts in people from the lbtgq you know uh 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 neighborhood if if you will uh, a lot of people from from glad and just try to tell that but that resonated with a lot of folks the other thing that i think resonated not not so much a story but the the continuum of this thing passing down from generations i cannot tell you how many people and and jacob and and vincent i'm sure you you've had the same experience uh, people saying you know, I watched this show because it reminds me of when my grandmother babysat us and she's gone now and I miss her so much. And so I continue to watch this. I can't tell you the number of people that came up to me and told me that they learned to speak English from watching all my children. 
you know. Um, and it, it just it, it was, you know, there's nobody in your life, in your home, at noon or one o'clock, five days a week, unless they're family or very close friends. And so that put us immediately into that very close friends box. I don't think they necessarily want us as family, but certainly very close friends. And, you know, we were, we were important to people. Um, they, no matter what their life may have been like, good, bad, just kind of floating along, they knew that they had people, you know, and, and that was the takeaway for me of, of uh, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they, they had opinions about individual stories without a doubt, and they'd be happy to tell you what they were. But just the care and the connection, I think. And a lot of these folks, I think it was their main connection, their major connection in life, you know. Well, just so you know, that that's sort of the impact I would say for why, why I put okay. this together, you know, is because of that, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who miss your faces. And they're all, you know, we're all, seriously, we're all quarantined. You're right, you were in their living rooms five days a week. You are considered family so oh, sure. in that respect i thank you for doing this because that is helping people but vincent you go ahead sorry <laughs> yeah i was going to say that for me i mean i obviously everything that walter said i completely agree with that's i had we all had similar experiences with that throughout our careers the one that really had the most impact on me was after 9 11 and i was at the set the canola working on the morning of 9 11. Um, I had just gone through the Lincoln Tunnel, the helix. The last sight you always saw was the Twin Towers before you went into the tunnel. And it was this perfectly beautiful day, 110 mile visibility day. Went to work. Paul and I were about to do our first scenes as we were on our first date. And the scenes were very flirtatious and fun. We were in my work dressing room and we're like, oh, these are going to be a, a lot of fun. It's going to be great. We go into the makeup room and we're sitting in the makeup room right before we're going to go off like early onto set to rehearse together. And somebody comes running and says, turn on the news. Um, a plane just crashed into the tower, one of the towers. They turn it on, but it was a long shot. You couldn't see close up. It looked like scorched at the top of the tower. And somebody says, well, if somebody must have been a small plane and they, they just didn't see it. They miss it. They go, it's 110 mile visibility out there. Whoever hit that tower did it on purpose. It may have been suicide. We didn't know it was a jetliner at the time. We go upstairs onto the set, and while we're up there, we're rehearsing scenes, trying to get up, and the monitors are on, and the whole crew is watching for the second the second jetliner comes in and hits the second tower uh, up close. And everybody realizes it's a passenger plane. People freak out, and we're like, what the heck is going on? And um, the, the, the director comes back on set, okay, everybody, let's stay focused. We've got to keep doing this. All of a sudden, Manol and I, it's a totally different feeling now. We're trying to rehearse these scenes, and we're like, what the hell are we doing? This feels really strange. The, the, the fun, the playfulness, the flirtation was kind of going out the window. Once that tower came down, first tower, everything went crazy. There was a, a, an extra who was on set. She went hysterical because her daughter was just dropped off at a daycare just blocks away from there. She went crazy. Um, everybody just stopped. And I don't know if you guys remember this. None of you, none of you were there that day, but the crew then was announced that they were going to be taken away. And I remember Nadine Aronson, she called the whole crew onto set. Um, and one of our producers, we all held hands and we said a prayer. Okay. And the crew went to the news after that. I was stranded in New York for the rest of the day because the bridges and tunnels were closed. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that when we came back to work a few days later, we all were so just in a state of shock, obviously, that this had happened. And I never felt more a sense of futility as an actor, frankly, during those first couple of weeks. I felt this feels bizarre that I'm acting. This is a, I'm on a soap opera and this is what I do for a living. It felt a little strange to me at the time, in all honesty. And it reminded me of uh, uh, Armand Artaud, who was a French director from like 1920s. I read a book of his years earlier and he talked about being in world war one in the in the um in the trenches and somebody asked him what he does when he's when he wasn't in the war and he said i'm an actor and he said i felt this sense of futility that's kind of how i felt um mm -hmm. weeks later though we were getting letters from people about how important it was for them to have us on their tvs during the afternoons to continue on that tradition and that sense of escapism from the burdens, the trials, the struggles they were suffering with throughout their days. 
um, which many of them are. And again, just like Walt said, I mean, it's generational, and Jacob um, talked about that too. This is, it is traditional to them. They have been doing it for 40 years for all my children, 40 plus, and other shows as well. And it finally gave me, and uh, even just talking about how much relief they had to feel the joy again of watching us, to get a sense of normalcy in their lives. And for me, that's really when I realized that I had, that it wasn't significant in contribution to the world at large and to, you know, to human experience, the enterprise. And that's what I appreciated most. And it reminded me of that, that there has some great value to it. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah, so. you make a connection. The question, Aiden and, and Jacob, you haven't spoken, uh, just about fans and, and the connection to them, you know, meeting them over the years. Is, it, is there something that stands out from a story you've told on, on the soap or just meeting them? Jacob, you want to go? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, the, the soap fans and all you guys know this and we've, we've talked about this, they're the most unique fans because, you know, to them, we are our characters. We're in their living rooms Monday through Friday. Uh, they relate to us. Um, that's why they call us by our character names. That's not an insult. It's actually a compliment uh, because we are we are absolutely giving them uh, that fantasy escapism that they're not getting in their their day-to-day -day life um but the interesting thing i think i think most importantly is that the the biggest and the best fans are still with us to this day and they're they mm -hmm. they are still the, they're still marching that that same flag and they still love all my children and um and i still believe you know that uh, you know if disney plus or somebody doesn't jump on all my children there's bids that are going out there right now that are happening. And I think all my children has, has a chance to come back. If it's not in a primetime situation or a 13 episode sort of series on digital platforms, but um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of interest in that. And I welcome that with open arms because again, this was the most rewarding experience I'd ever had in my life as an actor was working on all my children. And well, all, I, I'm sure all, all, all the rest of his actors know now that Jacob said that, that there might be, all my children might be coming back. We know we're going to be shackled to our Facebooks for the next three or four days trying to <laughs> that comment to people. Uh, but I, you know, I... I yeah, that's what I was going to say, Walt, is the fans, you just, by saying that out loud, there's going to be a campaign in about five minutes that Absolutely. you just started, yeah. Jacob. You see this random <laughs> of soaps thing it was on last night, night before last. I didn't yeah, Tuesday night, Tuesday night. Tuesday yeah. night. And I know my Facebook lit up with how dare they, the history of soaps after what they did to our shows, you know, <laughs> they were so angry that ABC would dare put on a thing about the history of soaps after what they did to all my children and one life to live, shame upon them. And Ryan Soap PS. But uh, I, I think that, yeah, you know, Prospect Park, I, I, I was set to come on for that second season, I guess it was. You know, they kind of they kind of dropped the ball there. I mean, they were supposed to be up and running like Thanksgiving. We were off the air in September. They were supposed to be up and running Thanksgiving, I think it was. Yeah. It was like another year and a half before they It was a year and a half. It was almost a year and a half. None of that time educating yeah. the core people, people my age, you know, who'd watched it for that 40 years that you were talking about teaching them how to watch it as a stream as streaming content that's true and, you know that thing had gotten so cold by that time that well you know there wasn't a chance in hell uh, but i said this i said this the other day um as it will turns guiding light all my children one life to live if they had just survived on the air slightly longer you know the streaming platforms when all four shows went off the air were just getting their foot they weren't all you mm -hmm. know there weren't as many there i i think a lot of the shows might have so, you know, survived on the streaming platforms if it had just been a little longer. I think it well, just wasn't. Well, Alan, I have to add, I have to add to this, is that all my children, you know, their ratings were not in a situation that were, you know, as dire as some of the other shows. Right. The, 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 this show was canceled, and it was canceled because of one person that was in charge of ABC yeah. Daytime at that yeah. time. He did That's not right. believe in daytime right. soaps. He decided that he wanted to see the demise of AB. He told well, he, me he believed in one daytime soap. <laughs> right, one daytime soap. Yes. Well, one life to live and all my children were both in that rope. 
Yeah. And yeah. and he last sued them up and he put a noose around their necks and he said, no, no more. So, yeah. um, and he told me that he told me that personally at, at super soap weekend. And he told me on a separate time after that, that he's like, I don't get why people watch these shows. And you know, I, and I, I was like, yeah. Jacob, I want, can I, I want to contribute to that, what you just said. I, there's one thing that's very important that I saw, and Walt, you probably may have noticed this too, throughout the course of the years that we worked in the medium. When I first started working on Guiding Light, there was a very clear distinction between the creatives and the executives, all right? The creatives were the executive producers, the head writers, the people there. You had the producers, those producing the show, okay? I mean, the, 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 the financiers, it was like Procter & Gamble. When they came on, when 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 the executive producer and the head writer came up with a story, they went with it. They trusted them as the creatives. With that person you're talking about, Jacob, when he first came on, he changed that at the time. He wanted to micromanage everything. He wanted to be a creative as well. And he started making decisions for the show that were creative, basically usurping the role of the executive producer and the and the head writers. That was where it really, from that progressively, little by little, he was chipping away because we were all scratching our heads with some of the decisions that were being made in story and content that it was shocking. We we're like, what is going on? Why would he Why would he think this is the right way to go? It was a level of arrogance, frankly, that really, and Susan Lucci said it best, this person came on and inherited a very healthy show. And I agreed with her 100%. When he came on and did that, he basically was chipping away little by little and to the demise of the show. It was it was so frustrating to watch to the expense of everybody that was a part of it and the viewers as well. Yeah, exactly. Well said. Yeah. Both of you well, both of you well said. Aiden, did you have something to share about the fans? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I missed that because um, I had a technical uh, difficulty. <laughs> technical <laughs> difficulty? <laughs> Well, I do want to say this. Walt was bringing up earlier that people used to come and watch the shows all the time and how they would talk about that they learned English uh, by watching our shows. I said, and I wanted to say, I think that uh, unless they were listening to Aiden in his um, scenes. Aiden learned English. Aiden English. learned English. You know, I kind of, I kind of missed that. Uh, people were making fun of me. My, yeah, 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 Vincent, my that. mother, my mother yeah. and my grandmother learned to speak English on Guiding Light. And I was a really? real friend. Oh they, they moved here from Holland. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's yeah. awesome. A after the war. So they, they definitely learned to speak English. That's how I got introduced to the shows is because they turned them on, you know? Yeah. But Aiden, oh, yes. Share some that's, why, that's probably why the first time I met you, Alan, I think you were wearing wooden clocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Walking around sure. New York, Manhattan. In New York City in, in, in wooden uh, Dutch shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's I think we lost Walt. Um, yeah, I texted him. I, I texted him to see if he's going to come back to say goodbye. But Aiden, if you did, you have a story you wanted to share? Um, yeah, um, in relating to just a, in, in terms of fans, you know, meeting fans over the years, is there something that stands out for you? You don't have to. I don't know. What, what I'm, well, I mean, so many, so many. Um, the the one of the difficulties with me is I remember walking to the train station to get my uh, train back to, to Brooklyn when I first started in 2000. It was just right after September 11th and um, people would uh, would shout my name and I would think it would be somebody I know. And because my my character's name was the same name. <laughs> oh, and I would oh, that's got to be tough. I on the show. And I, well, th thank you for that. I really, and I'd give them a hug and, you know, when you could back, when you could uh, hug people and they get, on the train and learn my lines on the train and go back to uh, back back to my place in Brooklyn. But there was um, amazing that the fans of of all my children and other soaps they are very dedicated and they're so lovely and you know they're giving and they do anything and they just that you know it's um, that's just something that I haven't experienced since you know since then that that kind of uh, support. Um, but there's a lovely lady, uh, Kimmy. Um, Kimmy on wheels. So we we met at Super Soap Weekend, two thousand and God it must be two thousand and three now. And uh, yeah, just always you know kept in touch and and uh, um, making sure that she's okay. And uh, I think she lives up in the northeast some somewhere. But she's just always been so just so you know generous in spirit and in personality and reaching out. But well, yeah, that's fantastic. Really 
time with all of us being there in New York. It's a shame with that executive coming on, and we all, you know, know who he is. And and oh, trust it, me, the name is going up with a few expletives. Kind of, you know, there's a few expletives going up on the comments from the fans with his name at the moment. So don't they yeah. all know who? I mean, great guy, he's a know. family guy. You know, executives do, but there, there, there's, there's always that. You know, there's always the executives and the, and the CEOs and the, they, they, and then the creators. And then so, you know, some shows get cancelled and um, some, it's a bit, there's um, sort of a disconnect, which is unfortunate. You, you would hope that in Hollywood now that there, there's no disconnection. I just watched uh, a series called Hollywood, which is amazing, but they, they had the disconnection. Oh, uh, the, Ra the Ryan Murphy. Uh, I, yeah, I want to see that. About the bottom line is about money and how can they save money and how can they get the same amount of viewers or whatever and then get uh -huh. the, without paying all the people but it was it was a tough time i remember you know in 2010 that, what would happen with all the camera guys and all the crew and and all the people that worked in the wardrobe department you, you're talking like hundreds of people yeah. that yeah. came to work on the show for 46 years maybe i'm wrong maybe it's 47 yeah. so please don't hate we get it and I, I love the chew it. I love cooking I used to be a chef I love the chew uh, we watch uh, the great British baking show and the American equivalent I mean, I, and I, the chew is great and, love that show and, uh, but yeah <clears throat> what, what a show all my children it was one of the less soapy soaps and it, you know, there wasn't any crazy there were crazy storylines yes but they were well, let's hope, Jacob is, let's hope Jacob is right and that it will uh, come back. Walt, before <clears> we go, I keep seeing behind your head. Are those uh, pieces of art that you've done? Oh, yes. Yes. I've, yeah, I'm in my studio. It was about, I figured I have the best connection here. Yeah, those are, uh, those are some of the watercolors uh, I've done, uh, kind of covering a hole in the wall. Uh, <laughs> right there, there. Too cheap to plaster it again. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's been a great therapy for me. I gotta tell you, it's been a great therapy. You know, that's great. Well, yeah, gentlemen, sure. I can't really thank you enough for doing this today. I know the fans have st stuck with us for almost two hours, so I really, really appreciate you taking the time. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. We really appreciate thank it. So, thank you so much. I I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off, but stay backstage so you guys can talk for a minute, and then. Uh, We'll say goodbye. But thanks for doing this. This, this is the good right. stuff coming yeah. up, in other words, right? This is the no. good stuff coming up. Yeah. The good no, stuff's coming up. Yeah. Exactly. We'll keep on this, Alan. <laughs> okay. What'd you Alan, say, Vincent? Great hanging with everybody. I was just going to say it was great hanging with everybody, and especially to get to see all of us looking like we're coming out of a Civil War reenactment with our beards. <laughs> and our it's like I, I, I finally can get a man bun going here. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, like, like a friend, I'm telling you, don't. No, yes. yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that, brother. Man. All right, Love guys. You guys. Stay backstage. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Oops. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I'll see you Wednesday of next week. Have a great Memorial Day weekend.